Good evening and welcome to the YouTube channel of the Manchester and Leeds Instituto Cervantes. Today we have the second event of our series on bilingualism, which we designed with the support and coordination of Dr. Julio Villa Garcia, senior lecturer at the University of Manchester, whose field of uh, research uh, is focused on the subject and will be introducing uh, Dr. Yaron Matas, Emeritus Professor of Linguistics at the University of Manchester. Thank you very much uh, to you both uh, for having accepted our, our invitation from Instituto Cervantes. It is a great honor for us to feature you in a program that has a central, uh, a central uh, role in our work as an institution which promotes Spanish in multilingual environments. Bilingualism and multilingualism, despite being uh, the predominant reality in many countries, is a subject that has been widely studied by the academic community, but the general public is not very aware of. Over the years, popular knowledge had manifested various ideas about bilingualism that have predominated for some time. For example, it is thought that children's developing brains do not work well when learning uh, two languages simultaneously, that acquisition of language is the day and that they, the, they end up, sorry, uh, not learning uh, neither language as well. On the contrary, the bilingualism series will show the benefits of speaking more than one language and that bilingualism, far from being a limitation for the process of intellectual development for children, is an enormous advantage. It makes us more flexible, aids attention and concentration, and above all, allows the coexistence of pres and preservation of cultural diversity that enriches our societies. In this session, Professor Jaron Matas and Dr. Julio Villa Garcia will discuss the circumstances and effects that contact with languages and bilingualism had on individuals, languages, and societies. They will discuss how languages influence one another, how we can study language contact phenomena, and what generalization can be made about the impact of language contact and bilingualism on the shape of languages, and what the policies implications of the multilingual society. And also how can we raise awareness of multilingualism and meet the needs of multilingual communities. Let me remind you that the next conferences in the series will be on the 23rd of June and will be feature Antonella Sorace, Professor of Development Linguistics at the University of Edinburgh. I will now introduce Dr. Julio Villa Garcia. Julio Villa Garcia is currently a senior lecturer in Spanish linguistics and sixth class in the Department of Linguistics and English Language at the University of Manchester. Dr. Villa Garcia, in the course of his PhD at the University of Connecticut, was trained as a theoretical syntactician as a language acquisitionist working with the framework of minimalism. His current interests lie in the areas of Spanish romance and English linguistics. Other interests include also child language acquisition, bilingualism, and the application of theoretical linguistics research to foreign second language pedagogy. Thank you very much to our audiences for being there. And I give the floor to you now, you Julio. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Pedro. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. This is the second event of our bilingualism series, and we are very excited to interview. Actually, I have this honor today to interview my former colleague, Professor Yaron Matras. Okay. Manchester Emeritus Professor of Linguistics, Yaron Matras, studied at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem as well as at the University of Tübingen. He later attended Hamburg University, where he received his MA and PhD degree. Professor Matras came to the University of Manchester back in 1995, where he was a full professor of linguistics until very recently, 
when he actually became emeritus professor. He is also honorary professor at the, uh, of forensic linguistics at the Aston Institute for Forensic Linguistics. He has written numerous articles and books on a, on a variety of topics and in different branches of linguistics, the study of human language. In addition to an unbroken record of publication, Professor Matros has been the recipient of numerous prestigious international research grants. Professor Matros is considered to be the most prominent scholar, the most prominent figure in the field of Romani linguistics and has worked on many other languages, especially Germanic and Middle Eastern languages. His work on multilingualism and language contact more generally is likewise pioneering. And most recently, he has been particularly interested in the issue of urban multilingualism. In fact, as part of this more general enterprise, Professor Matras launched the very successful multilingual Manchester project more than a decade ago. Throughout today's talk slash interview, Professor Matras and, and I will discuss a number of key aspects surrounding bilingualism and multilingualism. And since I don't want to, 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 to spoil it, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, we will start. Uh, so please, without further ado, uh, join me in welcoming Professor Matras Yerong. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes a todos. And uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Looking forward to this. Thank you very much, Yerong. It's a real pleasure. So as I said, let's maximize time. People uh, have been anticipating this interview uh, very much. So, you know, uh, here's the first question uh, for you. Uh, it's the forbidden question for any linguist, right? Because, uh, you know, as linguists, we are usually asked the question of how many languages we speak. And inevitably, I need to ask you this question. How many languages do you speak? How many languages you study? What's the origin of this passion? Where does this come from? And how it's connected to your professional career? Okay, well, thankfully, there's several questions in one, so I can, I can uh, easily avoid the question of how many because it's not easy to put a number. Um, but I'll turn the, the question into another question, that particular one, um, what is a language and how do you count languages? Um, and do you count languages that are very, very closely related uh, as one or as two? Uh, for example, if we take Spanish and we take the very closely related Ladino, or also referred to as Judeo-Espanol, are these two different languages because they're spoken by two different populations and have a slightly different accent? and a different writing system, or are they one and the same language used in different situations by, by different people? Um, and there's no easy answer to that in linguistics, and, and that's at the macro level. And so certainly at the micro level, when individuals um, learn um, bits and pieces of different languages, it is very difficult to count. And, and that, in fact, I think brings us, uh, or could, could, could bring us later on to uh, a key issue of interest especially in the field of, of social linguistics, so the study of language and society and, and multilingualism today is, is uh, the enumeration of languages brings us to this issue of how do we conceptualize languages? Languages are now, we appreciate with globalization and migration and the fact that we have so many what we call heritage speakers, so people who grew up in one place uh, but absorb some of the language of their parents or grandparents, but not necessarily uh, in full fluency but they still feel a connection with, with those languages or bits and pieces that speakers have actually repertoires of linguistic resources. And they're very individualized rather than having languages that are clearly demarcated from uh, between one and another. And, and people of um, South Asian background, for example, in Manchester, young people would normally speak English to one another, but when they are together, they will you know, at, at liberty use various expressions from a variety of South a Asian languages that may be related, such as Punjabi and Gujarati and Urdu and Bengali, uh, um, without even sticking to any one particular language, but just mixing things in. Um, and so we really are, are speaking now in the study of multilingualism. Um, and, and again, I, I'm kind of projecting from the question that you asked me to society more in, in general, uh, that we, we don't, we, we like to not enumerate languages, but, but talk about uh, repertoires of uh, resources. And, and in that connection, so I, I um, 
I really can't even point, uh, I'm sorry to kind of be deconstructive for, for question after question, but it's very hard for me to also point uh, to a particular point in time where I developed a passion for languages because they've always been around me. So I, I grew up in a, in a multilingual city uh, in Jerusalem and in a multilingual household. And pretty much everybody I knew around me at the time when I was growing up uh, had some kind of multilingual background as well. Um, and, uh, and Hebrew and modern Hebrew in Israel is, is anyway an interesting case because it's a language, uh, it's the only successful case of a language uh, revitalization, a language that hadn't been spoken. It was written but not spoken. Uh, and my uh, mother belongs to the, the, the first or second generation of speakers of, of Hebrew, and it was one of the languages that I grew up with. Um, but when I went to secondary school in, in Jerusalem, half our teachers spoke Hebrew as a foreign language and made mistakes. Um, so, so it was an odd situation where the pupils would correct the teachers. Uh, in regards to, if not spelling, then grammar and, and pronunciation. So, so imagine, so that, that's a very kind of um, almost upside down uh, chaos kind of um, system. But I think we're, we're, we're appreciating more and more that that kind of multilingualism and play around with different language resources is the default rather than the exception. So, so languages were always around me. I was always interested in them. Uh, I learned bits and pieces of languages from my grandparents who between them spoke six or seven different languages uh, from my neighbors um, and, and from others. And um, I was uh, particularly became aware of the power of language um, and multilingualism to build bridges. Um, Jerusalem, of course, has been in the news yet again uh, in the past couple of weeks. Um, and uh, it's a situation that, that has not changed uh, significantly uh, in its core since my childhood, since I was growing up then. Um, but uh, I, I learned, we all learned some Arabic um, at school, but at the age, as a, as a teenager, the age of around 15, 16, I actually um, looked for immersion opportunities with, with Palestinian Israelis and Palestinians in the West Bank at the time and was involved in, in various uh, dialogue initiatives uh, back then. And I, I very strongly believe that at the age of around 16 or 17, I was, I was fluent in Palestinian Arabic and probably was one of the only people of my age group uh, who actually learned Arabic through immersion. Uh, there are many people in my age group now who, who on the Jewish side who know Arabic, uh, but there weren't back then, I'm, I'm quite sure. There were some people that may have had uh, Judeo-Arabic dialects from home, but, but not through um, immersion. Um, so that's something that kind of looking back uh, at, the, at the time, you know, it was a natural thing kind of for me to do, but, but it, it went in hand in hand with, with the, the strong belief uh, in dialogue and breaking boundaries in partnership in equality uh, and social justice. And, and that remains so um, also kind of throughout my career. And I, I, um, I think my, my involvement, my, my interest in um, in going to Germany, uh, which I did uh, as an undergraduate student to study and research German dialects, uh, had also partly to do with building bridges. It was a very unpopular move at that time for an Israeli to go to, to Germany. Um, and later on, in, while in Germany, I, um, I continued to, to learn various languages of the Middle East. Um, so rather than enumerating them, I'll, I'll kind of give you an, an idea. I, I uh, am um, familiar with and comfortable in most uh, languages of Western Europe, except the Celtic languages and, and uh, most languages of the, of the Middle East uh, and some languages of Eastern Europe. And then I have structural familiarity with some South Asian languages and some East Asian languages uh, as well. So rather than put a number on it, th those are my kind of areas of, of interest, um, including historical um, uh, languages. Um, but I, I learned, um, uh, Kurdish and Turkish and other languages, and, and then Romani through um, immersion. And in, in, I was active in um, initiatives in, in Germany to support uh, asylum seekers and, and, and immigrants. And in that context, I uh, met uh, Romani people uh, who remain the most marginalized and, and persecuted and discriminated against community in Europe to this day. Um, and started to work with them on various campaigns and picked up the language, uh, in fact, in several different dialects simultaneously. Uh, and that's what kicked off my, my interest in, in Romani. And I think I then had a kind of a second time around. Uh, I very, I believe, uh, you know, that in the late 1980s, when I was a student, I, 
I was pretty much the only or one of just a handful of non-Romani people in Western Europe who spoke fluent Romani. Um, so that was kind of second time around. Um, but but I, I remained kind of passionate, did a lot of work on, on, uh, on Romani. And after moving to Manchester, um, very much kind of inspired by the multilingual reality uh, of Manchester, um, uh, developed an interest both in the various languages spoken here, but, but also in um, how cities actually manage their multilingualism and, and what we can do with, with that, with all implications also for, for policy, um, as well as, again, once again, building bridges. Uh, and that is something that I, I, I have to say uh, in the past few years uh, has given me hope, but also um, but also uh, concern, you know, what, what is happening, um, you know, growing intolerance uh, in, in a place that uh, when I moved here was uh, you know, very, very uh, known for its tolerance uh, and that people are, are getting attacked on the street for speaking Polish uh, or, or something like that. In the past few years, uh, that, that's been something of, of great, great concern. Uh, to me in the UK. And I, again, I still believe in the power of uh, interesting people in, in other people's languages um, to, to be able to kind of build bridges and, 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 and more kind of confidence in, in uh, cross-cultural encounters as well. Wow, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of those in more detail. Uh, let me ask you a little bit about the idea of language contact. We always talk about how languages establish a contact situation and, you know, inevitably and avoidably, there is mutual influence on many levels. Uh, well, uh, since you are the, the expert, uh, to what extent can we generalize how languages influence one another and in what circumstances and how can we go about studying this? How can we approach this issue? Okay, well, uh, first of all, languages influencing one another is, is very much a metaphor. They, they don't actually influence one another. And in um, contact linguistics, we use the metaphor of contact. We call it language contact or contact between languages. And of course, languages don't contact, they don't touch one another. Um, so what's the, how do we resolve that? Um, it is speakers of users of language who come into contact with one another. And it is their behavior, linguistic behavior, that may change. Their linguistic routines can change. And if they change in a, in a perpetuated way long term, um, then when we generalize about you know, what structures um, and linguistic forms and features are available to individuals when they call something a particular language, um, you know, then, then that can change over time. So basically what we call from a descriptivist perspective as, as linguists who are interested in abstracting, um, that's what linguists all, often do. You know, we, we kind of build abstractions of language structures. Uh, what we call languages influencing one another is, is in fact speakers changing the way they use um, elements um, resources that they have at their disposal. And I, I mentioned before that we're talking more and more about repertoires of language resources rather than just individual languages. And when, when children grow up in a, in a multilingual environment, uh, in a bilingual environment or multilingual environment from infancy, um, it's very interesting that um, I mean, earlier studies suggested that children actually don't initially have the capability of differentiating languages, that that is only acquired uh, at, at a somewhat later stage during the phase of, of acquiring the la language uh, ability. Um, that's quite controversial, uh, but what we do know is that children initially, when they just start using words, they don't differentiate actively. Uh, I, I think we're, we're, there's quite consensus right now among researchers that you know, children do differentiate. Um, and they, they realize that different interlocutors, maybe mother and father or parents versus neighbors or whatever it is, use different languages. They do realize that, uh, but initially in the, in the active output, if you will, you know, the words that children use, they, they don't differentiate initially. When they start differentiating, that differentiating is based on situation. It can be the interlocutor, or they might know that at home you use these words, and you know, when you go out, you use other words or that television uses this words and that the family uses other words. But the labeling of languages comes much, much later. 
So while children are already able to differentiate and already speak and speak in sentences and code switch, so switch from one language to another in full sentences, full correct sentences, they still don't have that conceptualization. This is French and that is German. That, that comes much later because those are social constructions. The way we label language and the way we put boundaries or language is an artificial construct. Now, of course, it's not one that's alien to us. It's part of our social behavior. It becomes part of our identity. And for some people, part of our nationalism that we rally around and use to exclude others. So there's a whole range of, uh, you know, from the most tolerant um, uh, multiplier to the most uh, extremist isolationist um, ways. But, but nevertheless, in all of those, we sometimes live with the concept that there are different languages. It's a natural thing to us, um, but it's not built in to the way we process language. And, um, and sometimes, you know, multilinguals are often asked, just like we're asked, how many languages do you speak? We're often asked, um, how do you remember all your languages? And I think those of us who grew up with several languages, um, actually, we know that the, the issue is not really how to remember them if they're languages that you use regularly. Um, it's how to keep them apart. You work hard to keep apart your languages, to remember Right now, I'm talking in this context to these people, so I'm only going to use these words and, and not the others. And, and you sometimes struggle. Well, whoops, there's that word that, you know, how am I going to say, you know, aprovechar, you know, what's the right word here in, in, in English? How do I capture that particular flavor? Because there's nothing in English that exactly captures aprovechar. Now, if you don't, uh, you know, take advantage of, take whatever, it doesn't quite capture it, does it? Now, of course, if somebody who doesn't have that word in their repertoire, who's never been exposed to Spanish, doesn't have that dilemma at all. <laughs> but once you do, it enriches your repertoire. And once it enriches your repertoire, you cannot freely use it. You become disadvantaged when you have to choose for one language or the other. The natural thing, if we could, is to always use everything we have at our disposal all the time. And I personally feel most comfortable speaking to three, four people that I know who have exactly the same languages, or not all, but you know, many of the languages that are most important to me in my daily life, so I can freely switch and I don't have to kind of have that exert that extra control. So what happens in language contact is that those routines are broken and, and the demarcation boundaries, the imaginary are renegotiated. And, and users of language say, right, well, this word or that expression or this way of pronouncing is no longer something that I only use in these settings with those people. I can also use it with another set of people. And so basically the, the, the routine of communicating and of selecting items from your repertoire of language resources is changing. Uh, and over time, if many people do that, and if a whole community of people do that, uh, we can observe that change has taken place. Change is by definition a historical dimension, what we call in the study of language a diachronic dimension. So diachronic between two points in time. Uh, and language contact is, is, is that kind of change. So we, we compare how language was used in one point in time and, and how in another point in time. Um, and basically there are um, two motivations um, that drive that uh, redrawing or renegotiation of, of boundaries. The first is um, to enrich modes of expression. Um, and that inevitably relates to innovations or cultural specific products, or sometimes ways of capturing, you know, semantic nuances, like my example with the child before. Uh, but if you look at, you know, a good example are, are, are Arabic loans, um, in, in Spanish. In, so, so we have um, things that are products such as um, um, aceite, azit uh, from Arabic, the uh, oil, olive oil, um, or certain offices such as alcalde, uh, alqadi, um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so those are concepts that are introduced, either artifacts or administrative offices to, to stick with just those two examples, uh, arroz, you know, something which is very, very basic, you know, if you like paella, uh, you know, but it was the Arabs who introduced it, you know, arroz uh, in Arabic. Um, so, so it's uh, new artifacts, new objects, or new administrative structures or concepts, um, or avoiding them. Uh, I spoke about Ladino before. So Ladino, you know, it's almost the same as Spanish, the same vocabulary. Uh, but how do you say Sunday in, 
in Ladino, you don't say Domingo because Domingo is the day of the Lord and the Lord is a Christian Lord in Spanish. So you say Dia del Chad. Chad is Arabic and uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic for one. Uh, and Dia del Chad is the day of one, the first day. Um, everything else is the same. Lunes, Martes, Miércoles, but not Domingo. Domingo is Dia del Chad. So avoidance can also be a reason to um, cross language boundaries and take something from Hebrew into the Judeo-Spanish. Uh, or else innovations, technical innovations, new products, kangaroo, banana, things we didn't know before we had cultural contexts, uh, we take the names of those objects. So, so that, that's one motivation and it's very powerful and it affects primarily what we call the lexicon or the vocabulary, the words that we use because objects that we identify and routines that we identify, we identify through what we call lexical words, dictionary entries. The other motivation is to make that process of managing the repertoire easier. Um, I was talking before about how bilinguals have this dilemma. How do I keep everything apart? How do I manage the, and, 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 and we make mistakes, you know, sometimes. When you're tired, you know, when you're stressed, you know, we, we sometimes say the right word, but in the wrong language. Uh, especially if you have two foreign languages, let's say you've studied French and Spanish and you're going on holiday to Spain and you're trying to speak Spanish and what comes out is French. So you're good at suppressing your English, <laughs> but then between the two languages that are foreign languages, you, you kind of, you make mistakes. So we, we have constantly lapses uh, in our ability to do what, what we call in, in the research um, selection and inhibition. So selecting the correct forms, the forms that are acceptable in a particular situation and inhibiting those forms that may be functionally correct, but they're not appropriate because people don't understand us or don't expect us to say those forms in, in that particular situation that is in that particular language. Uh, now that is a burden, it's a huge burden. And uh, when a bilingual community of people has to do this uh, over time, they try to inevitably, and it's a natural process, not one that is reflected uh, or governed, it's a natural process, people give themselves discounts. Why should I bother pronouncing everything in two different ways? Why not pronounce everything in the same way? Now, um, some of you may be speakers of Basque uh, or know some Basque, um, but if you're not, and if you've listened to Basque speakers, uh, they actually sound, you know, the language sounds like Spanish in, in many ways, you know, it's phonetics and then phonology. Of course, it has a very, very different structure. But if somebody who doesn't know Spanish and doesn't know Basques listens to them, I, I'm not sure they can tell them apart um, because the sounds are very, so most sounds, there are some slight differences where each one, most sounds are very similar. Languages converge over time. But speakers, obviously, if you stick with the example of Basque, of course, it's very important to the Basque people or to many of them to keep their own language. So, um, but, but, so it's a bit of a compromise. The sounds, you know, converge and become very, very similar in the way they're pronounced to those in Spanish. Uh, but the grammar and the vocabulary stay separate and languages end up with different kinds of compromises. Some languages uh, are found where um, much of the way we organize sentences, for example, is, 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 is very, very similar. Um, or certain classes of, of grammatical expressions can be very similar. For example, all the connectors such as and, but, or, uh, however, can be, can be identical and, and people are not bothered. So, well, you know, it's not a problem. Um, just like, you know, for a German English bilingual, the words for internet are the same. Uh, that's, of course, a technological innovation, but the word for baby is the same. How do you say baby in German? Das baby. Uh, and that's not because it's a technological innovation in the lives of Germans that they only began to appreciate when they met English speakers, uh, obviously. So, so it's natural for people to have certain elements of the repertoire that are independent of, of any specific language. Um, and that's a kind of a compromise uh, and it makes it easier to process uh, that, um, um, that challenge to, to manage, to inhibit and select correctly and, and be in control over what it is that you're using from your repertoire of language structures. Within that, um, it seems that some grammatical structures are more susceptible to that kind of convergence than others. And I've spent a greater part of my uh, professional career working and collaborating with others to try and find out, uh, can we find, can we really generalize? And, you know, there are some generalizations. 
It's very difficult because um, you, you need in, in linguistics as in other sciences, um, we cannot study the whole world at once, you know, but we want to be able to make predictions and generalizations. So what we do is we study samples and we try and, and infer from those samples uh, about the behavior of, of the wider world. And it's not just today's uh, 6,000 plus languages, it's also going back 150,000 years of human history uh, where we had more languages that have since disappeared. So, so we're talking about you know, um, hypothetical kind of projections here. Um, and studying language context is very difficult because we need to know about the history of the language. Uh, if we, we don't know, you know, if we didn't have the written history of Spanish and Arabic, we wouldn't know that arroz is an is a Arabic borrowing into Spanish. We wouldn't know that if we wouldn't compare. Um, now we've got that luxury for Spanish and for Arabic, um, but most languages of the world are not written down and have never been written down. And so we don't really know much about their history. And so we're very limited in terms of how much we can sample to study and make generalizations about language context. Wow, Yaron, that's, that's very impressive, very inspirational, very clear. I can see that the audience is completely dazzled. They are hypnotized. So there are no many questions in the chat as of yet, but I'm sure they will pop up as we go along. I hope it's not the kind of hypnosis that puts you to sleep and makes you climb the walls. <laughs> no, I don't English. think it is. <laughs> if it is, be careful. <laughs> so bilingualism, you know, one of the goals of this series and one of the goals of, of you know, talking to people about bilingualism is, is to basically try to cure it, okay? Uh, the question is, how do we change societal attitude? What can we do to alter, to change monolingual mindsets? We don't. We put in key positions those people who have a multilingual mindset and hope that they will take decisions. That's what I've learned after some, you know, decade odd years of, of activism uh, in, in um, you know, in a multilingual city. <laughs> uh, and if you look at, um, so one of the things that uh, we did in, in our research here with, with uh, the team in Manchester was uh, for a while we, we had close links with um, colleagues in Melbourne and we did some comparison about um, language policy in Manchester and in Melbourne. And, and I have to say, I mean, Manchester has uh, actually fantastic provisions for interpreting and translations. For, uh, for example, uh, particularly in the healthcare sector, it has a huge level of awareness um, in schools where there are many, many schools in the city who for many years have been celebrating language diversity in different ways. Some do it on in September in the European Day of Languages. I don't know if they're still allowed to do it now. Uh, others do it on international UNESCO, International Mother Language Day, which I've been campaigning for years to rename as Mother and Father Language Day, um, but nobody's listening. Um, and, and there's different ways, you know, the schools do a wonderful job. Libraries in Manchester have multilingual provisions. So it's a city with a lot of awareness, uh, but still nothing, not quite what we find in a place like Melbourne. And uh, one of the reasons that, uh, partly it's the political structure because Melbourne is, is a very large city in Australia, but it's, it's within the state, the state of Victoria. There's a state government and then there's a federal government. And we, of course, don't quite have that structure here uh, in England. You know, we have Scotland and Wales, and they actually manage, and Northern Ireland actually manage their languages. Uh, Wales has done wonderfully well in managing its regional language. Scotland has two rather small regional languages. And in Northern Ireland, they're still, still arguing over it, but at least it's, it's a topic of conversation. Uh, in England, we don't have a state level government below a federal level. So the systems are different, but uh, the point I'm getting at is that in Melbourne, there is uh, in the in the political uh, you know representation and, and the people who are decision makers uh, are to a large extent people of multilingual backgrounds. They are the children or grandchildren of immigrants, um, and uh, and in some very few cases the the people of, of Aboriginal background who also were or are multilingual. Um, and they, they share this awareness of, of multilingualism and, and they're fairly recent immigrants compared to places like the United States or, or even Canada. Um, so the awareness of multilingualism is, is, is still very strong in a place like Melbourne, 
where in many, many other ways, its traditions are, are similar to, to what we find in, in England. Um, and in Manchester, we've seen enormous changes um, in regard to how a, a city council, for example, pays attention to language as more people are elected who are of you know, bilingual background, um, you know, whether they're Latvian or Somali or Bangladeshi of their background, whatever, the more people be, get, get executive um, uh, functions like that. Um, and so I, I think, you know, in those places, when, when we talk about the mo mo monolingual mindset, we are talking about um, those countries that uh, have a, um, an understanding of themselves as a nation state with a clear national language that everybody shares. And, and in this country, this is very much the case. I mean, we've had just two recent prime ministers, um, uh, Theresa May in a speech that she made uh, just shortly after the Brexit referendum said, we will succeed because our language is the language of the world. And, and Boris Johnson uh, last year called on, on everyone to adopt English as their first language. Uh, he sort of didn't even seem aware that we, we actually have in this country the Welsh Ang Language Act, <laughs> which is a law <laughs> that says that people in Wales are entitled um, to uh, safeguard their language as well. Um, so there is that you know, very, very easy kind of um, forgetfulness among people who are, uh, there's a kind of an inertia uh, among people who are, are not necessarily multilingual. And uh, to, to, as my understanding is both Theresa May and Joy Boris Johnson actually studied foreign languages, uh, but, but they don't have them from home. Um, so I think what we need is, is we really need a, um, a political class and, a, and, a, and an executive class, uh, but in the private sector as well as in the public sector and in, 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 in policy making, um, that brings together people of, of diverse backgrounds, just, we, just like we talk about diversity in the boardrooms and diversity in the police and in every other respect, uh, with respect to language policies, we, we require that diversity so that people who don't feel that multilingualism from home in their background uh, can benefit from those who do. Uh, now, in my experience, um, cities, uh, are um, much more inclined as, as institutions and, and as, as public bodies to take multilingualism into consideration um, than nation states. For one, nation states basically, um, well, there are exceptions, of course, there are, you know, the, the nations that recognize regional languages like, like Spain, like, like Britain when it comes to Wales and, and, and others, but there are others who don't. And, um, and um, it's very easy for nation states to try and rally around a national language, uh, as, as in the quote that I, that I mentioned. Um, whereas in cities right now, if we look at kind of what most Western European and North American cities, uh, but also beyond that, I'm sure, you know, places like Mexico City and Kuala Lumpur and, and others, 40% of young people, certainly in Western European cities, um, are multilingual, uh, maybe even more. And, and, you know, and, and, and this is young people going to secondary school today and in 10 years time, those will be the people who will be executives and managers uh, and, and so on. So, so the future of all of those cities is, 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 is multilingual. And uh, uh, partly because, um, you know, if you, if you compare Italian immigrants to New York City uh, 50, 60 years ago, the general pattern was the first generation maintains their language, second generation knows bits and pieces, third generation knows a couple of expressions, uh, and that's all. Um, but, time, but this has changed because uh, globalization technologies, they give people opportunities to um, engage with their languages in a variety of different ways. And um, Punjabi is, is a good example in Manchester, it's a language that for many households skipped a generation. So people came here, first generation immigrants from the Punjab in Pakistan. Um, they uh, worked very hard to learn English because they wanted to assert their Britishness. Um, they um, continued to speak Punjabi at home, but in places of worship, they used Urdu as a language to communicate with others in, in, the, in the South Asian Muslim community and Arabic for prayer. Uh, the, the first generation born in Britain um, was sent to weekend schools to learn Quran in Arabic, and they were taught in Urdu, but of course their first major language at school and work was English. The third generation grew up at home not needing anymore to assert their Britishness because it was obvious, 
but being taken care of often by the grandparents who by now were retired who spoke to them in Punjabi. So the third generation <laughs> often learned Punjabi better than the parent generation. Now they didn't learn to read and write, but they go online and they write their Punjabi in English script, in English alphabet, and they communicate with people who use Punjabi like that in America and in Canada and in Punjab as well. So there's international networks. And these are things that didn't exist uh, a couple of generations or two, three generations ago. And so multilingualism and these multiple identities uh, that go along with that, they, they're here to stay. Uh, now, of course, there are counter trends. And, and I, I mentioned before, and things that personally I'm, I'm very much concerned about um, these counter trends. Um, but I still think that you know, cities and, and frontline services in cities they have a duty and they realize that duty to, to cater to everybody. They need to provide access to services. They want to develop skills. They have a duty to take into account different heritage traditions because they want people to identify. And I think that is something that cities share. So I'm a great believer these days in um, you know, letting whoever wants Brexit to have Brexit, but you know, have networks of cities come together and communicate with one another and keep up uh, the momentum of a, of a global world and a world of diversity and you know let those who don't want to do their thing but but you know still remain in, in that kind of cities network and learn and inspire one another um, I, I think so I, I think you can't beat the monolingual mindset but you can sort of bypass it and and do something constructive alongside it and, and let them let them do whatever they want as long as they're not violent. Thank you, Yaron. Um, a, a brief question has um, been raised in the chat, which I will ask before my bigger question. How multilingual can Manchester be considered to be? Um, how? Very. <laughs> um, I mean, what, I'm just thinking of what, what kind of dimension to answer that to. Maybe just a few statistics. Um, well, as I said, about 40 to 50 percent of young people, that is people who are school age, uh, are multilingual from, from school, uh, are multilingual from home, um, at the very least. And, um, and uh, there are anywhere around 200 languages. Again, it's, it's for the reasons I explained before, very difficult to count uh, languages exactly, and, um, but, but somewhere around that. Um, I can tell you more specifically that um, if you look at Central Manchester Hospital Trust, for example, that has a very uh, established and kind of well-oiled machinery, uh, one of the best in the world, if not perhaps the best in the world, of providing uh, interpreting services for patients. Um, they deal with uh, well over, um, um, uh, you caught me there, I've forgotten the figures are actually, the, something like 100,000 a, a uh, inquiries, uh, or, so interpreter jobs a year at a budget of, of one and a half million pounds, roughly it changes from year to year, um, covering about, about 100 different languages. Um, so uh, most of them are concentrated on, on the top like 12 languages, but, but there's a, a huge variety of languages that are catered for, which, which tells you something about the, the demand. Um, however, at the same time, only a very, very small percentage um, of people in Manchester who have another language do not know English. So the percentage is, is not more, well, we, we're waiting now for the, the census uh, was just carried out a couple months ago. So the only figures that are available are, are the census from 2011, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, but on that, it was only about 3% in greater Manchester of the people who speak other languages do not know English. But that's a very tiny percentage. So, so all of those interpreter requests are, are you know, relative to population to a very small size. Um, and perhaps one, one other um, statistic is that, um, or two more rather, um, if you look at the city's uh, language landscapes, uh, as we call the multilingual signs, so shops or uh, cultural institutions or, or, or sometimes sometimes public institutions put up signs in different languages. Um, there are around 50 languages present on signs in Manchester. Now you think 50 languages, that's quite far from the 200 that are spoken, but you must remember that many languages are not written down at all. Most of the languages of the world are not written down. 
you know, there's anywhere around six, 7,000 languages in the world. Most of them are not written down, as, as I mentioned before. So most of the African languages, for example, um, Caribbean, Creoles, um, minority regional languages like Romani uh, uh, or others are, are not usually written down. So, so 50 languages in, in the public domain um, that are present, it also shows you about commerce. Uh, you know, the, if you have signs in, in Arabic and, and uh, Kurdish and, and Polish advertising, you know, for retail and services, that shows you that a lot of commerce is taking place in the city in, in other languages. And the final statistic is um, concerns um, schools that are operated by community groups at weekend or at evenings, um, so, and, and, and teach um, heritage languages. So, um, so I'm not thinking right now of, of institutions such as um, Cervantes or, or other um, public institutions that teach languages as foreign languages, but those that teach languages, um, home languages to, to people uh, of their of, um, uh, particular heritage. Um, and there are um, somewhere around, we don't even have an exact number, 40 or 50 uh, of those um, teaching uh, at least 25 different languages uh, in Manchester to a population of anywhere around 10,000 children. Um, so so that's, a, that's a significant um, kind of number in, in, in the greater Manchester area. So, so languages are very, very much part of the, of the city. Wow, you're on so many, many repertoires of resources represented in the city, right? So I have a last question, one of those big questions I've been uh, posing you. Um, What's forensic linguistics you mentioned? I mean, we mentioned at the outset that you are currently honorary professor at the Aston Is Institute for Forensic Linguistics. People may be wondering, well, you know, we all know what forensic means, but what exactly is forensic linguistics and how does this go together with the issue, uh, the main issue of bilingualism slash multilingualism? Well, uh, forensic linguistics is, is simply the application of linguistic science in, in judicial procedures. And, and there can be a whole range of, of different activities uh, ranging from um, uh, commercial disputes over trademarks. So is, if somebody comes up um, with, you know, Pepe Cola, which is like Pepsi Cola, are they allowed to market it? Or did they actually steal the label from somebody that has a protected trademark? Um, all the way to identifying, trying to identify the identity of the author of a text or uh, a voice sample. Uh, and the latter is something that is often done in criminal cases. So for example, the police may have recorded uh, the voice of a suspect. And uh, based on that recording, they try to ascertain you know, who that person is either by comparing it to a controlled sample of somebody that they have in custody and, or have recorded, or, um, and this may be the, the most interesting part, by trying to pick out features of the person's speech and see where does that lead us to, you know? Uh, can can we find the gender and the age and the accent, you know, the the place where they grew up and perhaps how educated they are and so on, simply by listening to the voice or rather the the forms, uh, the features um, um, that they use. Um, so my involvement in this area is uh, around the use of um, the study of dialect to try to um, uh, confirm uh, or not um, the account of somebody as to where they are from, or sometimes also to, again, try to identify in, in, in criminal investigations um, where uh, a person, a speaker who has been recorded is likely to be from. Um, so for example, um, uh, well, much of the work that I've been doing uh, involves appeals in uh, asylum procedures. So um, the government currently allows, based on international law, that people from particular conflict regions such as Syria, uh, if uh, they are, are automatically entitled to asylum, if they manage to enter the country, uh, and of course, and, and they have to make an application, um, but they also have to prove that they're from Syria. Now, if they have no documents and, and no other way of proving, um, then the government or the government actually invariably for these countries does what they call a language analysis. Um, they currently, the practice is they interview them for about 20 minutes remotely via Skype or telephone. 
But of those 20 minutes, 10 minutes are, are taken up by explaining to them what the procedure is, putting questions, the interviewers. So we really get something like eight to 10 minutes netto of, of, of a person speaking. And on that basis, the government uh, outsources to various private contractors and said, can you tell us whether the person is or isn't from Syria? Um, and um, uh, I'm involved in part of a, of a circle of, of linguists uh, internationally who, who are um, uh, critically uh, assessing these processes to make sure that uh, there is quality assurance. Um, there have been many, many appeals um, against negative decisions when the government said, no, your accent proves that you're not from Syria. And in cases specifically that I've investigated of um, Syrian applicants, 40% of the cases uh, are overturned by the courts upon appeal. So that means that there's a huge error margin. Um, so one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in and is, is how can we improve uh, the quality assurance and, and, and everything that we've been talking about so far uh, plays a role. So, you know, language is not DNA. Uh, it doesn't, first of all, it changes over a person's lifetime as well. You know, your accent can change. Um, and people uh, are subject to various influences. And if you were to, you know, record me now, which you are doing, um, and give it to somebody who is a specialist in English social linguistics, can they figure out my nationality and my origin based on the way I speak English? I don't think so. At most, they will be able to say a few things about what possible influences I had during my uh, uh, you know, um, uh, lifetime, which is becoming longer and longer now. Um, and, and so there's more and more influences, but even young people who migrate, you know, somebody who left Syria and the crisis region at the age of 17 would have spent maybe a year and a half on the road crossing Europe in the company of young people from other Arab countries and may have been susceptible to many other influences, not to mention that even growing up somewhere in Syria, you have your everyday local dialect, you have your prestige urban dialect, you have the languages of social media, you have the language of other media. Um, so, all, so, so our repertoires are complex and it's very difficult in, in a series of questions uh, for eight minutes, you know, to, to really um, pinpoint with, uh, with uh, precision. Um, and there's many factors that need to, take, to be taken into account. And of course, we're talking about, in these cases, people's lives, you know, whether somebody who is entitled to protection or is sent back potentially to a, a war zone, it is literally a matter of, of life and death. And, and so it's, it's a very, very important issue. Well, this is pretty, this is pretty, pretty nice. I, I guess the, the whole thing about forensic linguistics is, is, is a big world. Uh, Catherine Santo uh, writes about uh, a movie called uh, The Unabomber. I hope I pronounced it right, which apparently features uh, forensic linguistics in it. Uh, I don't know if anybody would like to comment on that. Professor Matos, we're not expecting you to comment on it, but that's one of the things that have come up in the chat. Um, it's fascinating. I could be asking questions forever, but of course we, we want to keep it short and we want to give people an opportunity to ask you any questions. So um, I don't know, any final comments? that you would like to, to make, uh, anything that you think should be added to what we've discussed? Maybe I missed some key question to ask you. Um, Sorry, are you asking me or are there? Yeah, yeah, well, I, haven't, I haven't looked at the chat, so, so I, I don't know if there's any. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I would like to put a question if possible, yeah? I would like to ask you, Yaron, you said that the city's cooperation, the, the networks are very efficient on this, uh, um, support for the multilingualism as a, a reality and richness for the society. Could you give us an example of uh, frameworks of uh, cities who are working, uh, which are working in this field and uh, as a, a best practice, best practice uh, example? Um, okay, well, um, so I think it's kind of in, in, in individual institutions um, and, and their reaction uh, to uh, multilingualism and uh, rather than a legislative uh, um, framework, but, but there are good examples. Um, Brussels is one of the leading and, and I, you know, Brussels is anyway a bilingual city officially with French and Flemish and, and has been for a very long time, but, but simply the, the languages of, of immigrants, uh, be they um, civil servants in the EU institutions or 
uh, immigrants who come to work, have come to work there and settled there from a variety of different countries um, uh, outside of the EU. So, so Brussels has had a discussion going on and um, sharing of best practice. Uh, Berlin is a city where there is um, uh, quite a few uh, initiatives going in that direction. Barcelona uh, has uh, been has had cutting edge initiatives, uh, as as has Dublin um, as well. Um, now it's very interesting that in in many of these cases, actually of those that I mentioned, all except Berlin, uh, we're all talking about cities that um, already have an indigenous bilingualism and an awareness of of regional languages or or um, or a, a binational bi bilingual rather. Um, um, society or state uh, to begin with. Um, and so there is an awareness and also funds available for civil society initiatives. Um, but I, I think these are all good examples of um, collaboration. So best practice there is, you know, what I consider to be is, is collaboration between civil society initiatives um, and, um, and uh, governments, local government initiatives, public sector, public services, um, as well as, as researchers. Um, and I, I would put kind of Manchester uh, as well at, at that level. I think, you know, we, we've done a lot of work um, through multilingual Manchester over the past decade um, in um, bringing together research with public engagement, uh, with public sector services, um, with, uh, with local government to raise awareness. One of the things that Manchester has done as a city is uh, adopt, uh, as I mentioned, UNESCO International Mother Language Day as a regular celebration. Um, but celebrations should not be, be underestimated. They, they set a tone, they set a bit of an identity. Uh, and I think you know, that means that many others um, can benefit. And, and I've also come to the conclusion after a decade and after leaving the, the university uh, a few months ago that um, these initiatives are really best placed as, as, as uh, civil society initiatives. Uh, and having them confined to either local government or to universities, I think is very restrictive. Uh, and that is, a, if I may, you know, I'm kind of very grateful for, for support that I received from the university for many years um, for this initiative, um, although it was never taken for granted. It was, you know, ups and downs as with any support. But I think that um, certainly if it had been an initiative within local government it, uh, or within any one institution, it, it wouldn't have been uh, as successful. But I also think that there are limitations um, and, you know, universities are places that can serve as, as an incubator for an idea, uh, but they need to kind of hand things out. And what we have done over the past couple of years with Multilingual Manchester is um, these annual celebrations of languages. We've kind of handed over to a city council initiative in the libraries who are now doing it uh, with many, many partners, uh, of course, the Cervantes Institute uh, included. Um, and uh, much of the public engagement is now placed at Manchester Museum, um, which is great because that's the place uh, to make it sustainable. Um, and as part of you know, what the museum does, it represents the culture of the city and it continues to shape it. And, and, and that's where that is placed. Um, and, uh, and so you know, the university can and should continue to engage with, with those initiatives, I believe. But, 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 but I think that, um, Yes, we, we need partnerships um, for this, both within cities and across uh, cities. And, and what I see personally see myself, maybe uh, a note to conclude on kind of on, on, uh, in the next few years um, is trying to uh, work to um, bring together uh, initiatives in different cities uh, in the world um, to uh, connect and to share good practice and, and to uh, inspire one another, because again, it's a, it's a turbulent world. Um, and we've seen a lot of regression back to the kind of tones of, uh, you know, our language is the language of the world uh, sort of thing. And, and I think, you know, that that needs um, to uh, some, some counterbalancing. And it can really only be done if, if uh, people give the, each other the moral and the practical support um, to continue to think about multilingualism with an open, with an open mind. Thank you. Great. Uh, there are a few interesting questions in the chat, one of them being, do you have any tips for raising bilingual children? Oh, yes. Um, how much time are we got? <laughs> uh, well, um, yes, uh, 
so so what I can say is um, my my email address is I think still easily accessible if you kind of Google my name and it's my name at manchester.ac.uk but if you simply Google my name you'll you'll find it quite easily and I'm very very happy to um, engage in, in individual conversations with people uh, the reason I say that before giving a reply is that uh, the, the the first part of my reply is that situations and settings are so individual um, and so it's very hard to give global advice. Um, and, and so I, I would really normally not even kind of uh, take it upon myself to, to start giving an answer before I've asked a few more questions about the specifics. But because we, we, we don't have the, the time for that right now in, in, in the setting, I would say that um, one important thing is, is to be consistent, uh, to be consistent in the use of language. And um, usually uh, it is, I mentioned before that the natural inclination is to mix uh, and so, so keeping languages separate is, is something that we acquire through socialization. And so we need that role modeling um, because just like I used to compare it, you know, to, uh, you know, how does a child know not to stick their finger into the electric socket? Because you tell them. And if when the child were to do that uh, and you were to do that with them, uh, then the child would never know, you know, that that's something that's dangerous. And, and likewise, without the danger aspect, of course, is, if, if you're speaking to your child, uh, say in, in, in Spanish, and they answer in English, and you then switch to English, you're basically not giving the child any guidance. It's like saying, okay, oh, you're putting your finger into the electric socket, good, I'm gonna do that too. Uh, you know, instead of setting those boundaries, those boundaries need to be set as, as a model, not with any sanctions, of course, don't punish your children for speaking English, but help them if they don't know the word, help them out. Um, now that's fine if they hear you speaking English somewhere else because that's also natural. You know, when you go out to Sainsbury's, you use English. You don't use. You don't expect everybody there to use Spanish. But if in your home you want them to speak Spanish, be consistent. Number two, enable um, uh, opportunities um, for your children to hear your language uh, in other situations as well. So that you know whether it's media, whether it's travel abroad. Um, whether it's friends who um, speak your language um, and show them that it's a, it's a language that's viable and it can get them places um, because um, your attention and your love and your interest in them will always be taken for granted as a parent uh, and it's never predicated on the language. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so, there's, so the motivation to continue with your language um, is, is limited unless there are also other prospects to use the language. Um, because otherwise they can always fall back to whatever is comfortable for them and they know that you will always love them and you will always be there for them. Uh, and that's fine, that's how it should be. Um, so enrich their experiences, give them more experience in their language uh, or in the language that, that you want them to, to speak and to learn um, and, and, and be consistent with, with that. And I think uh, in a nutshell, that that's the kind of piece of advice. And beyond that, um, like I said, I mean, situations are, are so, so different, but I'm, I'm very, very happy to um, engage in individual conversations with people if you'd like to write to me. Thank you, and that's very kind. There's another interesting uh, question, which has to do with how to combat monolinguistic, sorry, yeah, monolinguistic mindset, monolingual mindset uh, yes. on a personal level. Yes. For example, how you, Talk about it with people you know and so on yes well i very much don't like the word combat um so i i, I don't want to combat and i don't want to um you know persuade um it's it's one thing to 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 um counter people in positions of authority whether it's the prime minister or your school teacher you know if the school teacher says you shouldn't be talking to your child in spanish at home because that distracts them then I would, I would not combat, but I would counter. And I would refer to expert advice and such advice can be sought. Um, and specialists in bilingualism at any university in the world. I, I almost guarantee you at Randa, write an email to anybody who's got specialists in bilingualism and ask them, would you mind writing an email to the teacher, the head teacher of my son's school and my daughter's school because they said this. I mean, we are all so passionate and from our, you know, our research of the last 50 years, shows that there is absolutely no disadvantage, rather the opposite in, in bilingualism. So, so my answer is um, where appropriate, draw on expert advice, if that can help you. 
and and like I said, I mean, I can't guarantee that every linguist in the world is is publicly engaged, but but certainly, um, and I can't guarantee that they will all reply to you, but they certainly know that that is the case, and many of them are are passionate. And I, I will refer here to the network called Bilingualism Matters, which was founded by your next speaker, Antonella Sorace, and and and. Um, and that network has branches in, in something like 20 different countries uh, and they have websites so again bilingualism matters look it up write to people and the people who are associated with those branches are educators they're they're researchers they're linguists and and they see they set up that network as a duty to explain to people that bilingualism helps you it doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, disadvantage um, you so I think coming with with such expert uh, views now now the word combat of course historically, is appropriate because people have literally fought wars to defend their language rights. Um, Bangladesh uh, is, is, is a place that's known for, you know, Bangladeshi independence was around language battles. Um, the uh, apartheid regime um, was brought down by the protests of Soweto uh, against the imposition of Afrikaans uh, on, on all uh, black schools. People in Europe tend to be very arrogant. They think it was the boycott of South Africa you know, we brought down apartheid because we boycotted South African rugby. Uh, I think that's, you know, for my instance, an overstatement of the people who brought down um, 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 apartheid were the people protesting in Soweto. And the protest started um, after that um, change in uh, educational provisions that, that imposed Afrikaans um, on all the schools that were not, that were not uh, white English. Um, so and and uh, so and there and, and many 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 more. So so yes, people have gone to war or to protest in in many ways. Um, but if we're talking about you know broadly speaking the kind of the democratic world, um, I, I you know believe in in argumentation uh, and the power of of drawing on expertise, uh, but also the power of, of of networking because that that strengthens and that builds confidence. Great, very useful. Um, the question arises as to whether we should give children incentives, such as, for instance, uh, you know, if you speak Spanish to me, uh, you can stay up for another half hour, or you go to the kitchen and there you can speak this language. What do you think of those? You know, that's a tricky one. Um, so first of all, let me say I didn't. Uh, I raised a, a child. Um, uh, that's why I'm so keen about this, you know, not just mother language, day, but mother and father language day. You know, my son learned his mother's language and he learned my language. Uh, and uh, we never did it in, 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 in like that. I, I think this is a, <laughs> I'm hesitating because I think this is a question about parenting in general. And that's sort of a bit beyond my, you know, do you, do you reward your child for anything else that they do? You know, um, for finishing their vegetables, or for, uh, do, you know, whatever it is that they do. If that's your general pattern, you know, rewarding them and, and giving them that kind of incentives, then maybe it'll work with, with language uh, as well. And, and, and I wouldn't dare to then, uh, you know, take it upon myself to kind of intervene with a general parental philosophy. Um, and it, it, I, I'll just say it's not my own and not one that resonates with me is one that I've observed uh, among friends or, or, or family. Um, however, I mean, what we must bear in mind compared to um, other activities uh, in the home um, is that uh, language serves a very particular purpose, the purpose of communication. And the best incentive uh, to uh, stick to a language, to keep up uh, the language, is the rewards of communicating. So I would advise to, first of all, ask yourself and your partner and family and friends, what reward can my child get from continuing to speak my language? That reward can be a film that they can see in that language that is not available in English, or if it is, don't tell them that it is available in English, um, you know, or, or going to a country and, uh, and being able to play with their cousins. And, and that's a remarkable experience. And they're outdoors where it's warm and, and, and whatever, they see great things and they can interact with them because they know their language. Um, and, and those are the kind of incentives. And for some families, it's a qualification. You know, I know many Chinese families in, in the Manchester area who tell the children, you, you should really speak Chinese because then you get another GCSE, another school qualification, 
and that will open up um, um, job opportunities for you and you'll have a career. Uh, and they can't guarantee that, of course, but you know, with, with Chinese, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a significant addition to the portfolio of skills, no, no doubt. Um, but does that also work um, you know, for Gallego? Uh, I don't know. I think people should still speak Gallego to their children if they want to, even though it's not wouldn't necessarily guarantee them a, a job uh, in UBS Bank or, or something like that. But maybe it will, you, you never know. Um, so, I, so I think you know, there's a range of things depending on, on where you see the, the level of the language. But, but in, the, in the first instance, rewards of learning a language are, are inherently tied to the rewards of being able to communicate in, in certain settings. And those are natural rewards. There is, uh, Professor Matras Yarong, if I may, uh, there is a famous quotation from, uh, from another famous professor from MIT, Ken Hale. Uh, basically, it reads as follows, uh, when you let a language die, it's like dropping a bomb in a museum. Uh, would you agree with that statement? See, these things are contextual. If I said I disagreed, then there's a risk that somebody would put me in the thing that, you know, I don't care about languages. And of course I do care about languages. Um, but if I'm pushed, I, I have to say, no, I, no, I, I, I disagree. I, I disagree, first of all, because of the, just like I disagree with, you know, metaphors like combat and so on. I, I, I you know, it, it's putting a bomb. I mean, that we, we see, and we've seen last few days again, what. What bombs do to people that that's not like that really isn't so I, I think we should um you know we should be sad uh and from a scientific point of view disappointed when a language disappears but it's not it's not the same so so let's even even if we need metaphors uh let, let's keep them kind of uh at bay um but it, it's not about the choice of words is it it's about the is it a significant event of a negative nature that a language disappears. And, and if we stick to that, rather than comment on the, the value of the uh, metaphorical rhetoric uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the quote, um, then I, I think opinions are mixed. So, so let me first of all say, um, linguists uh, began uh, around the, the early 1990s to develop a very keen interest in what we call endangered languages and, and awareness that many languages are um, being lost because speakers are abandoning, they're, they're not passing their language on to the next generations and shifting to another language and invariably a more powerful language. Um, now, there were several reasons for that spark in, in interest in the early 1990s. Um, one of them was the rising awareness of uh, the need to protect environment and species, no doubt. Um, so this applies to landscapes, it applies to um, flora and, and fauna uh, species, and it's linked to rising, growing awareness of, of climate change that, that began particularly in the early 90s um, and so on. Um, and, and that kind of concern. A, um, a second, I think, uh, factor was no doubt the fall of the Iron Curtain and the accessibility of many remote languages and beginning collaboration. Um, among uh, linguists, uh, you know, across what used to be the Iron Curtain, which kind of multiplied the accessibility of many languages. And a third is no doubt the, the emergence of, of digital technologies that allowed um, to document uh, languages and archive uh, languages. And, and I think that that kind of broadly speaking, but, but also um, epistemological, in other words, developments that are internal to the, to the rationale of scientific um, discovery, um, which also said that, well, if we want to make generalizations about languages, uh, just like, as I was saying before, in, in every science, um, we cannot study the whole world. So we can only study a sample and try to generalize based on that. Now, the more differentiated and diverse the sample is, the more we know about um, things and how they work. And that, that applies to right now, people are talking of course about vaccinations and medical trials and the effectiveness of, of this or that vaccine um, can only be predicted on the basis of the tests. And if different populations and, and perhaps different genetic predispositions are not represented, then we know less about the potential effectiveness of the vaccine. So to draw the, the analogy, um, you know, of course in a very different area, um, the more languages we are aware of, 
um, the more we know about human language in general. Now, there is no doubt that the trend is for languages to be lost. Uh, I forget the rate. I mean, somebody, some people calculate the rate of loss, just like they calculate the rate of climate change. And I, I don't really hold much of those numbers. And, so, and I don't even remember. But languages are being lost at a, at a high rate. And uh, clearly, from a strictly academic, scientific point of view, we have an interest in, in documenting, not necessarily saving, but documenting as much as we can, because in our life, certainly in our lifetime, but probably not for the next five or six generations, the world of languages will never be as diverse as we see it today, and it's already less diverse than it was uh, 200 years ago. There's no doubt about that. So there's a scientific urgency in that. Whether or not that means that we need to protect languages, that, in my view, depends invariably about what the speakers want. And this is a key. And we, we sort of sometimes in the discussion, at least among linguists, sometimes we, we tend to forget that. Uh, we cannot ask the panda bear whether they want to be saved or not. We decide we're going to capture you, breed you, because we want the next generations to see panda bears. Uh, but that's not the same as languages. Uh, now, my grandparents were speakers of a language that they didn't pass on. They spoke Yiddish, and they didn't pass that on to their children. And uh, right now, I mean, the, there's no secular Jewish population anymore that speaks Yiddish at all. Today, there is the Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, as they're called, populations, and some of them speak Yiddish. Uh, and they have many children, so actually the population of Yiddish speakers is growing. Um, but among the you know secular Jews who before the Second World War, um, you know, were a population of, of something like 10 million in, in Central and Eastern Europe and spoke Yiddish, uh, that language has disappeared in, in that population. It was not passed on. Um, and and you know, there are folkloristic attempts, there are um, to document, to use the language. Um, but my grandparents certainly never expressed any regret, uh, you know, that their language was, was lost. They appreciated when I took an interest. I was the only one of all of their grandchildren, which were about 20 of us, who took an interest. So they appreciated that, but they were also a bit embarrassed by it. And, and that was it. There was no issue there. Um, now, I did some work on a language called Domari, which is uh, an Indic language, a minority language that was spoken actually in my hometown of Jerusalem, but I never knew about it until I went to study in Europe and heard about it and then went back and documented it. And I wrote a book about it, many articles. And at the time when I started working on it in the late 1990s, there were about 40, 50 speakers, all of them elderly. Uh, and I recorded most of them. And uh, in the meantime, they've all passed away. Nobody passed their language on. And there's only one speaker left and um, she doesn't have anybody to talk to. So uh, uh, in effect, the, the language has died out or that particular variety of the language has died out. Now, I, I always, you know, I, when I was there, I, I asked people, well, how do you feel about the fact that your language is not being passed on? And they go, well, you know, it's a shame, but whatever, the, the, there weren't any hard kind of feelings there. And um, they had other priorities as well. And so now I'm saying this because at the time, you know, there were various grants around for linguists to go and document endangered languages. Um, but one of, you know, for some of those grants, you needed to qualify, you needed to bring a letter from the community, which is anyway, you know, what, what does the community mean? Um, from somebody in the community to say that they are working with you to preserve the language. But nobody, you know, I could have given somebody $50 and they would have signed a letter, but, but Nobody had an interest in that, and, and I found that a bit strange. You know, it's an imposition. The scientific agenda is one thing, and it is not always invariably connected to doing something good for somebody else. If we can, that's great, but it needs to come from them, and, and not every community wants to maintain their language. And, and therefore, I, I feel a bit uncomfortable subscribing to that kind of metaphorical rhetoric just like that. This is, uh, this is great. It wasn't a yes or no answer, I know, yeah. <laughs> so there are more questions as far as I can tell. And I think that, you know, even though we would probably spend hours, it's probably good if we keep it uh, reasonably uh, short or long, depending on how you look at it. So I'm gonna ask the director, Pedro Sebio Cuesta, uh, to take the floor unless there are any last minute questions. 
So thank you very much, uh, Yaron. Uh, thank you very much, Julio. It was really uh, brilliant, uh, so interesting. As you said, there are so many questions to, to be discussed. It's a very rich uh, um, you know, topic with so many implications that we have been through the, your, your talk. But uh, anyway, we are very happy with you uh, to be here tonight. And uh, I hope the, the audience had also enjoyed uh, this uh, talk. And we will uh, see you, I hope, on the 23rd of June with uh, the, another uh, conference of our series. Thank you very much. Thank you again for the invitation. It was a real pleasure to be with you tonight.